Astonishing Legends Network. Listen to the Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishing legends. There's something about the feel of the pen in your hand. Hello, Tess. How are you doing? Love the giant glasses. Your microphone's muted. Todd takes it. He does his magic and comes out beautiful every time. There I am. The paranormal could be a creative expression of the universe. Well, that was not me. I don't know who that guy was. (laughs) It might be something you collect as a stamp as a kid or a sticker. That lady on the right there, I could Mm. not deal with that mask. It's been a little synchronicity machine of an episode here. Ed, roll those closing credits. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Embark, Squarespace, Mint Mobile, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Tonight, we're bringing you an amazing but relatively obscure legend about a young woman in Poland who, in the early 1980s, was surrounded by a series of events that most would attribute to a poltergeist. Her name is Joasia Gajewski, and her story is really only obscure outside of Poland. Within Poland, what happened to her made the national news for months. Everyone knows the word poltergeist. It comes from German folklore, and that's fitting for tonight's story because, as we all know, Poland and Germany are neighbors. The term poltergeist means noisy spirit or rumbling ghost. These manifestations are often marked by small objects being thrown around, furniture being rearranged, and physical assaults by something unseen. There can also be evidence of psychokinesis, the act of moving an object with one's mind or altering its physical appearance. Joasha Gajewski's story has, well, all of those. If you've listened to Astonishing Legends for some time now, you may be reminded of some of the events associated with our prior series on the Bell Witch or perhaps the Black Monk of Pontefract. But maybe it's a mistake to try and label these legends at all. For in our attempts to corral them into something we can understand, maybe we're shortchanging ourselves, denying the bigger picture, even if accidentally. We were intrigued by Yawash's story because of the preponderance of years of scientific research and ongoing observation of her. That, along with a large number of well-educated scientists and countless eyewitnesses to what happened when Yawasha was around. On top of that, this legend was recommended to us by an old friend of the show, author, clinical therapist, psychologist, and parapsychologist, Brandon Masulo. We've had him on in the past to discuss his first book, The Ghost Studies, back in 2019. He'll be joining us again for part two of this series, along with psychologist and parapsychologist James Horan, PhD, to dive deep into the theories on this case. But tonight, we must first share Yawash's story with you, dear listeners. After all, it's been a while since we did something spooky, hasn't it? Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. There is a fundamental difference between the scientist and the scholar. Only someone who has the courage to pursue and uphold the truth regardless of his colleagues' reactions, the etiquette of his profession, and conventional wisdom deserves to be called a scholar. Professor Julian Alexanderwitz, 1985. Join us tonight for part one of our series, The Elusive Force. And we're back. That we are, folks. Thanks for joining us again. We just wanted to give everyone a quick behind-the-scenes update tonight. First things first, as you may have noticed, the many-year-long dream of the Astonishing Legends Network has finally taken root with two new shows in the past six months, Scared All the Time and Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Yes, and don't forget the original AL Network show, The Midnight Library, which is about to start its 10th season. It has over 5 million total listens and 90-plus episodes posted. Yes, we've been fiercely independent for a long time now, which is why it takes us longer to do things, but we wanted to say thanks to everyone who has not only supported Astonishing Legends all these years, but also given these other shows the chance they deserve. 
Our philosophy is to find good talent and help them get a little bit of a leg up in a sea of millions of mediocre podcasts. And it's hard to make a mark these days in a field that was a lot less crowded when we started out. Uh, yeah, in our genre, it was really just Jim Harold before us. <laughs> the, <laughs> the OG, bow down. But, but really, thanks for listening and supporting the new shows. We want the Astonishing Legends Network to be a place you can trust for great content. Even if one of them isn't your cup of tea, we'll guarantee that if it's got our name on it, the people doing it are going for it and it's worth trying out. Yeah, so please remember to find all of our shows, not just Astonishing Legends, but The Midnight Library, Scared All the Time, and Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, and subscribe, follow, and then review them wherever you can, us included. Uh, yes, podcasts sink or swim on word of mouth. Almost nothing else works, so tell your friends about whatever show is your favorite and let them know where they can listen to it. As we used to say, without you, there'd be no us. Indeed. And of course, thank you for supporting our sponsors. That's how we keep the lights on and blanket for Diana. I know we mentioned in the cold open that Brandon Masulo, who's been on the show before, and James Horan will be with us for part two of this series. But we just found out that in addition to both of them, we're going to be joined by the author of the English translation of The Elusive Force, Joel Stern. He actually met the woman at the center of this story, Yawasha Gajewski. So that's going to be a powerhouse roundtable about this case for part two. You're not going to want to miss that, folks. All right, let's get this show going. This is a wild legend tonight. So where to start with this? We're going to talk about how this story fell into our laps, which it did, courtesy of our friend, as Forrest mentioned in the cold open, Brandon Masulo. Yeah. Just a little backstory for folks who haven't been with us a long time now. See, the show's getting old enough now. It used to be when I would say, oh, you remember this and you remember that, because it was in the past two or three years. Last year we had on (laughs) so-and-so. So, yeah, it's not like that anymore. It's now a long time back. So if you haven't heard, there's an episode we did called The Ghost Studies. You can look that up. We'll have a link to it in the show notes that we had on author Brandon Masulo, who has a degree in parapsychology from the university in Edinburgh. Right, right. And he's somebody that we've known back since Kent, right? Part of that crew. That's where he did a presentation. Yeah. Which yeah. Uh, captivated and fascinated us because it really informed us and introduced us to the concept of the recurring crisis apparition. Yes. Which is a type of haunting, you could call it uh, for the layperson, but a form of, I don't know, supernatural trapped energy that's in a loop, occurring with a, with a crisis, yeah. Yeah, in, in his book, he talks about some of these cases that would happen over and over because it was the site of an, a, a sudden unexpected death of someone. Yeah. And folks that uh, later were living in these spots, they would see the same thing over and over. Right. But in other cases, the crisis apparition would be a loved one that people would see right as the person was about to pass in a car crash or, right. or died of a heart attack, even if they were far away. Here's the thing I don't mind repeating in the stories. One, because I'm of that age, <laughs> that just happens. Secondly... A lot of people don't listen to every episode. We, we right. have the luxury of assuming that. And we've been told by even the our closest friends who listen all the time, like, yeah, I, I skipped that one. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, that's what uh, Brandon introduced us to uh, in various forms. And we also love it because it comes from a scientific parapsychological angle. And he's got data to back all that up. And that was the first of uh, two books. He's written another book about Haunted Medina County in Ohio as well. Both uh, really great reads, and he is uh, very well educated in this department, and he is working with other folks of uh, similar ilk, and those guys are going to be coming on to talk about this case in part two, and and Brandon wrote us and said, you really got to check this case out. It's pretty amazing. I I believe he's working on a paper on it. We'll hear more about that in part two with Dr. Horan, who we're going to be having on as well, yeah, where they're trying to analyze this case and take a look at the preponderance of evidence that seems to support that something was definitely happening. And the question is whether or not people can figure it out or what was causing it to happen. I just wanted to add, you know, when when Brandon Masulo says this is one of the best cases overall, not just poltergeist cases, but one of the best cases he's ever come across, we listen. Let's get to the story itself. We're going to start out with a little bit of background on it. This does take place in Poland. This all started out in a little apartment at 5 Plonów Street in Sosnowiec, Poland. And uh, forgive us on the pronunciations. Uh, (laughs) We're going to get emails. Yeah, we're going to get emails. So uh, we'll start off with the parents of this young girl who's at the center of this story. Their names were uh, Andre and Eva Gajewski. And the story centers around their 13-year-old daughter, who was mentioned in the cold open, Joasha Gajewski. Yoasha at the time was in the sixth grade at primary school number one in Snusnoviet, not too far from the address that was mentioned. Right. I guess I should go back. I want to talk about where we're getting the background from here. And that is from a book called yes. The Elusive Force. 
a remarkable case of poltergeist activity and psychokinetic power. Now, this book was originally published in Polish in 1989, but the English translation only just came out. That was done by Joel Stern. It came out in 2023 and was published by Anomalist Books. Mm-hmm. Great website if you want to find books about all yeah. kinds of If you listen to our show, Anomalist has a ton of stuff that you'd be interested in reading by Jacques Vallée, all kinds of things. So when we said in the cold open, the story is not really that well known. It, it is in Poland, but outside of Poland, it wasn't because it never got translated. So it, right, was a, right. it, you know, it was a big deal. It was a lot of crazy stuff that happened. And it hit the news over there in a very sensationalistic way. And like a lot of these legends, after people get past the initial shock of the thing and everybody goes and decides, well, it's a hoax, it's made up, it's Mm -hmm. tabloid journalism, they move on from it. So it was a big deal for a couple of months and sold papers. And then when people's focus shifted, it kind of died down a little bit. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Yoasha's parents, uh, the mother, in the book, it says she was a telephone operator in an office. I think that's a bad translation of receptionist. Probably, I think she answered the phones Um, for the office receptionist, uh, as opposed to, you know, an old-timey, like, pulling cables and switchboard phone calls. Yeah. (laughs) So just know, I had some friends that worked at a very large company where you are kind of a switchboard operator, even in modern day. Yes, that's true. They have those jobs. Yeah, you are. You are. So it's, it's a lot of work. And then her dad was a plumber at the steelworks there. And the thing to understand about Sosnoviet is it's a very industrial city, especially at this time. There's a lot of mining going on, heavy industrial business. As a result of this, and it's kind of sad, a lot of the kids in the in the town had asthma and bronchial issues. And the adults had some problems too, because it was a very industrially focused city. Now, I'm not sure if it still is or if things have improved there, but this was in the early 80s that this was taking place, 1983, actually. Times were different then, I can tell you, because a few years before this, I lived in Denver, and at that time, it had the dirtiest air in the United States. Oh, it was right. the mile high ashtray. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was really bad. On certain days you couldn't even uh drive cars if your license plates ended in certain numbers. They made you stay wow. home. Wow. Uh-huh. Anyway, that air is a lot cleaner now. I love I love Denver. My dad still lives there. I go frequently. It's a beautiful city. So there were things that were going on in the city in terms of health of people overall, but in this particular case, this family is living a modest lifestyle in their little apartment, and the grandmother and grandfather actually live in the apartment with the family. And Yoasha was super, super close to her maternal grandmother. Unfortunately, her maternal grandmother passed away on June 26, 1982. And this was very, very upsetting for Yoasha, especially since they all lived in the same house. Right. And I just want to mention here that the book makes some mention about her age, because as we've stated on the show before, if you know anything about poltergeists, have read about them or heard us talk about them, or there are some patterns that seem to develop and theories that go along with them. And one of them, of course, is it happens or seems to happen, at least with reported cases, mostly to younger girls, prepubescent girls. And it's something that they kind of grow out of later, but it does seem to be where most of the cases originate, that there's a lot of energy and they're not really sure, or people who research this aren't really sure why. It could be uh, hormonal changes, the intense chemical, uh, biochemical reactions that are going on with a young person at that age. And then it seems to die down, but that's where most of the cases seem to happen. And the book, it goes out of its way to mention Yuasha was of that age where most of these cases happen. And I just want to point out, unlike with other cases, that the events did not stop after puberty. So that's something else that fits this pattern and mold of telekinetic uh, stories and cases and poltergeist activity. But it's different in that way with a lot of them as well. That's right. That's the thing about this case. There are a lot of things associated with it that you almost might even call tropes when it comes to discussing the poltergeist, right. but there's other things that go way beyond that and that defy the standard definition, which was a little bit of the point of saying in the cold open when we talked about maybe it's a mistake to try and corral these things or label them or put this into one category, it, maybe it goes beyond that. And that's something that I've recently been thinking about when it comes to our show and our, you know, us trying to assess what's going on in any given situation or with any particular legend, especially as it relates to human behavior. We're trying so hard to put this in a package so that, okay, well, this is in this file cabinet or it's in this shoebox. And so now we're going to talk about this. So I'm going to go over to this shoebox. I'm going to take out the things in here that go along with this particular item. And sometimes I think that's a mistake because it's trying to present everything as black and white when really a lot of these paranormal things are overlapping in a more gray and amorphous way. And Mm -hmm. there's common ground between different things, certainly almost a 
cliche at this point, maybe with our own show, but just like, oh, the connection between Bigfoot and UFOs. Right. And it's like, oh, wait, it used to be everybody's like, no, this is Bigfoot, this is UFOs. And now people are like, <laughs> right. oh, wait, maybe they are connected. And then it's like, interdimensional. And then it's like, right. so may, who's to say that ghosts and poltergeists and the Bell Witch and Jeff the Talking Mongoose, that all right. of those aren't just different spots on a spectrum right. of something that we don't quite understand. Also, perhaps borrowing methods and means of modus operandi in that they operate maybe with some of the same unknown rules of physics with the paranormal. It's a grand unifying theory, perhaps, of some paranormal activities, but also the mechanics of how this happens, which is looked at in this case with the book, in that they try to, it's the other thing we really loved about this case is that we have, as much as you can get, real scientists looking at this and trying to figure out, okay, let's just accept that this is happening and this is beyond the scope of daily activities and then what is happening here and how is it happening? What can we ascertain by really focusing the study in a serious way? And what you're talking about here as far as I think how these things kind of happen, you will hear some things that ring true with other instances and sightings within the paranormal. Certainly that's the things that I think that overlap. Yes. And uh, then you wonder, like you said, are all these things operating with a set of uh, rules of physics that we just don't know about yet, but nevertheless operating within the rules of the universe. So it's not magic. That's what I mean to emphasize here. And then when you look at this case, in some ways, it is less supernatural, more of, it's like electronic fog. Mechanical. When we talk about that. Oh. Yeah, there's something going on that's slipping into another dimensional set of operations. We just don't know about it yet, but it's very real, and in this case, very wild and uncontrollable. Well, when we start to talk about the kinds of things that are happening around Yawasha, one of the first things that I want to point out is this acoustical component of it, which I just think was just amazing to hear about. But apparently everyone described, and not every time, but a lot of the times before something was about to happen, there would be a crackling sound. They would say that she would crackle and that people yeah. could hear like static discharge, high voltage discharge kind of crackling sound. And then another sound, and I heard this described as the same thing in different ways or as two different sets of sounds. So I'm not really sure because we got a lot of witnesses because some people were saying, oh, it's a static discharge, but in other right, people right. were describing something that sounded like snapping, like, like people yeah. snapping their fingers, which to me is very different. But you know, when it comes to describing stuff like that, it's very subjective and people don't always have the terminology yeah. to convey what they're hearing in a creative way, so. Right, and I think you also, need to keep in mind that when there is a translation, there is a cultural element of how things are described and what they consider different sounds. You can only, only have to point to how different societies and cultures and ethnicities describe animal sounds. Right. Right. Not everybody says the cow goes moo or right. the, That's the right. rooster Good goes cock a goo doo. That doesn't, yeah. Okay. Now Sarah's going to put that into a loop. <laughs> if anybody so. here from a, from another country will know like, no, 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 we, we say this animal does this sound. So there are slight differences between, uh, I think it has to do with language and how people hear something. But anyway, keep that in mind. I, I and mean, quickly here about the audible crackling. It kind of reminded me how people sometimes have described seeing a paranormal incursion into our dimension, whether it's a ghost, a portal opening, right. a set of tubular bells and <laughs> not Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> Somebody describing a weird happening, the crackling kind of goes in with like, if you've seen a spark, uh, you know, when you rub your slick soled shoes on the carpet and you touch a doorknob, yeah. there's a tiny spark. Seeing those little pinpoints of light that I've in my mind, have me uh, thinking of, you know, if you hit your head or you stand up really quickly and you see stars. Yes. Or just press your fingers against your eyelids and you have little tiny pinpoints of light. Yes. It's like that covering the image of what this person is seeing and people saying like, well, there was kind of like a little little star field of twinkling pinpointy lights and sometimes a crackling sound that goes with that. Like you often see it on Star Trek when somebody's teleporting or something weird's happening. Yes. But people describe this and I think it goes with that and that maybe this incursion into our normal sphere of uh, reality and existence and being is causing or having some kind of residue. And that's what you're hearing here. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. And the fact that these things can be preceded by that, it actually reminds right. me of something that I can't put my finger on right now. And I feel like it's in a movie 
but the crackling sound and then the event something happens. building and then yeah. it precedes right and then something happens uh, yes it's pretty fascinating so we, coming back around to what raised the red flags for people right. and the kinds of things that are happening to her one of the first things that happened uh, apparently happened on april 4th 1983 and this was when there was a a, a straw mat that i guess was mm-hmm. up on the wall and it fell on yawasha's grandfather's head and he apparently tried to fasten it back onto the wall, but it, quote, tore itself from his hands and danced around. <laughs> and he thought that Yoasha was pulling some kind of prank, but then when he looked at her, she was asleep. Right. And so to imagine this mat dancing around, and this was the kind of thing that actually reminded me a little bit of um, actually the Bell Witch. That's they right. They threw a blanket on the witch and tried to throw her in the fire. Well, they didn't know what it was. It's yeah. Just, there was a force there, and I can't remember the young man threw a blanket. Right over it and that took shape that's a little like barbara hershey and the entity where you freeze it like it, it takes shape there's a shape to it he throws right. the blanket over it tries to wrap it up he said it was like wrestling a giant you know snake or python or just writhing and right. as he moved closer to the fire it got heavier and heavier and heavier slowing him down and it was really a trial to wrestle this thing that did not want to be thrown into the fire and then he threw it into the fire right that's what's weird about this story in some of the cases we're going to hear about right now about these instances, that some of it just sounds wild and uh, unorchestrated. It's non-ballistic motion just all over the place. Yes. Unpredictable. Some of it does seem to have intelligent forethought. Yeah. And you don't know why, but it has intelligent action to it, as if something that thinks is behind it and other times not. So, right. and maybe it's a combination of, of both. But here, uh, when you talk about the mat and just kind of like, it did not want to stay on the wall or whatever. Right. Was, and, and it was it did dancing not around. To... <laughs> right. And so, the, and this comes down to the idea here, because this is something that really troubles me about this case. And I actually can't wait to talk to uh, Brandon and uh, Dr. Horan about this, is the nature of these stunts, I'll say in quotes, for lack of a better word, of yeah. the types of things that are happening. We're going to hear more of them in a minute. I don't want to spoil our own show, but like, let's start out with this. We've got the dancing mat. And we've got him struggling with this mat, almost like something out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. And it's flying away from him. And, of course, his first thought, the grandfather, whose name was Marion Tomeki, was like, what does Yoasha do? Yoasha has something to do with this. And he looks at her and she's asleep. So then it's, that gets to the whole thing about how does this even work if a poltergeist is connected to this young lady, which, as you said a few minutes ago, they often are connected to young women for whatever right. reason. What is happening that this is going on without her even being consciously participating in it? And so that, and that's an important thing that will come up as we talk about this case is the difference between the conscious and subconscious activity. Hey man, did you catch that today is National Pet Day? I did see that. And and of course, it'll be a few days before by the time people hear this, but uh, although in our house... Every day is National Pet Day. <laughs> they really do become part of your family. I mean, you've known Lulu since we got her, yeah. man. Like this, that was fourteen years ago I know, now. I know. Uh, and we're positively obsessed with Nixie, whom you met, and she's got to be the funniest dog we have ever seen. <laughs> Speaking of which, I was so excited when I found out that Embark sponsored us. Oh yeah, you know, I figured you were going to go in for that doggy DNA test thing. Uh, did you do it? Yeah, man, we we actually did that two years oh, ago, really? way before Embark reached out to sponsor the show. We'd heard that they had the most accurate dog DNA test on the market, and Emily really? was like, we have to do this. <laughs> she was dying to do it. And we'd been hearing a lot of buzz about it, too. I think some friends of hers had done it, and they were just amazed with the results. Oh, right. Okay, yes, I remember now. I, you know, But I didn't realize it was Embark, so uh, did you get any surprises? Well, yeah, both our ladies, as we call them, are rescues. And Lulu, she came straight out of Compton, and the rescue (laughs) place we got her from told us she was a toy Manchester Terrier. So that's what we told people when they asked. But turns out she's actually mostly what they call a minpin or miniature pincher, which is what we learned from her doggy DNA test from Embark. Here's what's hilarious, though. In the breed results on her page, it says, among other things, and I'm quoting, they are artful climbers and clever escape artist. And that is (laughs) cracking up because one time we had taken her to a hotel for like a staycation in LA and they asked us to leave her in her deluxe carrier whenever we left the room to go eat or go to the pool so that if they needed to come in and freshen up towels and stuff, they would do that. They wouldn't do that if the dog was out in the room. So she's in this carrier. It's got zippers and it's very nice and plush and she's comfortable in there. And we we go to have dinner. We come back to the room like an hour later. She's fully out of the carrier, (laughs) sitting on the bed like she's the Queen of Sheba. I was just what is happening here? How in the world 
did she get out? How did she do that? How's a dog uh, operate a zipper? I don't, I don't know. She let herself out of that thing. And uh, from that point forward, we started calling her Ludini. <laughs> well, there you go. Embark called it. Get the dog DNA test that is trusted by millions. Right now, Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health test for our listeners. Go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $50 with promo code LEGENDS. Visit Embark, E-M-B-A-R-K, Vet.com and use promo code LEGENDS to save $50 today. EmbarkVet.com, promo code LEGENDS. Well, we finally know of one person we've convinced that a Squarespace website is their best option for a web presence. Rich Haddam and his Paranormal Bookshelf. <laughs> that is exactly right. Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf podcast is really complimented by his Squarespace website. I mean, it looks gorgeous, and it's got everything you need for all things Rich Haddam, or Will, because he's just starting out, but it's really fitting for an erudite, sophisticated Hollywood <laughs> legend. I, I don't <laughs> right. know if you'd accept that label, but... Oh, uh, sure and, and it's not just because of the literary genre of his show. Squarespace lets you display just about anything you're doing, and you end up with something that's really you. That is so true because his site is so rich. <laughs> now, to be fair, he enlisted the help of our own super talented Squarespace expert, and you can find one too through the Squarespace Marketplace. But with Squarespace, you don't need to be a webmaster or a design dynamo, not like in the old days. Heck, even I can build stuff on our site and make it look good. And that's great for Rich because... <laughs> because he's a Luddite? <laughs> <laughs> well, he is, uh, Rich Haddam is not great with and doesn't care about <laughs> technology or computers. Um, yeah, and that's the point. Even with limited knowledge, Rich can get in there and tinker with his site to get it just the way he wants it. That's right. And that's great for anyone, whether you're just starting out like him or you have years of experience, because Squarespace is easy for beginners and time-saving for pros, and everyone ends up with expert-looking results. Another thing I love about Squarespace is that they don't just sit on their laurels. They're always evolving with the latest tools and technology, like with their new Squarespace blueprint, which is great if you're just starting out too. You can build a completely personalized website with a new guided design system. Choose from professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up, tailored to your brand or business and optimized for every device. Yeah, and something that you must have if you're just starting out because you need people to find you easily as soon as you launch your website is Search Engine Optimization, or SEO. Squarespace gets you discovered fast with integrated, optimized SEO tools so you show up more often to more people and grow the way you want. And speaking of the latest tech, Squarespace now has the power of AI. If you're not a gifted writer like Rich, you can kickstart or update written content on any website product description, or email with Squarespace AI, generating instant, personalized results that know and show your brand identity. Explain what your site is about, choose your tone, and enter what you need to get short or long-form text. No matter the placement, Squarespace AI makes it easier to go live, stand out, and succeed online. And there you have it, folks. Everything you need to know, show, and grow. Now all you have to do is find out for yourself. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Or use code legends. This is R.A. Fadley. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Not too long after this, things, objects, this is much more traditional poltergeist activity, start to fly around in the house. It's stoneware, it's plates, glasses are moving through their apartment, smashing into the walls and the furniture. The windows are rattling, the furniture is vibrating and shaking. The grandfather saw matches flying through the air yeah. and he would like try to stomp on them because <laughs> right. he was afraid a fire was going to start. It was yeah. just crazy. And when you, when you think about poltergeist, the movie, there's for those that have seen the original, not the remake... But uh, there's that great scene where they go up into the open the bedroom <laughs> and stuff is swirling in there like a miniature version of the Milky Way galaxy. The toy horseman. Yes. The toy cowboy riding the horse. Yeah, and comes up the lamp, to the, the person lamp looking in the window. 
Yeah. Yes, and, and turning off and on in her face. No, that's Craig a great, T. Nelson is just like, you want to see something? Take well, a look that, at this. He it was a great setup door. because, yeah. no, the parapsychologist from UCLA or wherever, yeah. they said that uh, we once stop motion this tiny toy car moved. It took about six hours or whatever, but it, but it moved it moved six inches. And he's like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. You like that? Yeah. I got to take this out. And yeah. uh, that here would be an equivalent but not comical in that way. Right. Well, I mean, it sounds silly to point that out, but that's a case where something is very deliberately showing off its power to an audience. I'm glad you said the showing off part because the poltergeists in general, they seem to be showing off all the time. Yeah, yeah. When you look at poltergeist cases, that's what feels like happening. And, that, you know, with the mat, it's like, mm-hmm. why is this a little dance? It's like you're putting on a little show here. It's like a stage right. show. Does, does this have to be rehearsed? You had to create a little character. <laughs> that like, it, it, And that's the uh. strange part about it because it comes down to the origin ideas of whether or not whatever is causing this, if you believe any of this at all, whatever mm-hmm. is causing it is connected to this person or independent of them and working as a team with them or in conjunction with them or is attached itself to them and working against them and trying to just make it seem like it's their fault, but it's not connected to them. So there's a lot of questions I have there if you believe all of these things are happening. So again, plates, glasses, all kinds of stuff is flying around the house, smashing into the wall. The upstairs neighbors are hearing the noise. They can't figure it out because they know the Gajewski family. They know them as a very quiet, well-behaved family. And now they're hearing what sounds like World War III happening downstairs. By the way, uh, one of the things that seems to be consistent in these cases with Yoasha is glass breaking. Yes. And when the glass is breaking, the fragments of the glass will essentially attack her or wind up on her or fly by her and cut her, cut her face. They're cutting her arm. They're flying all around the room. And the other thing that happens is sometimes they will hear like a loud explosion of something and then they'll notice that there's broken glass on the floor, but they can't figure out what the origin of the glass is. And that moment- It happened too fast. Not only did it happen too fast, they look around the room and nothing corresponds to it that's missing or broken in that case. So that's the other thing is where it's almost something spontaneously appears and explodes. But to your point, the other thing that's happening with these objects, and this is what's really fascinating, Yeah, the stuff is moving super fast. It's so fast that even when eyewitnesses are present, they can't see it until it explodes. Okay, mini theory here is that yeah. I think we may be witnessing, as we'll see here, where it's more illustrated in these other anecdotes, is a form of direct visual recognition of aportation. Yes. Because some things, as we'll see later on, end up in other rooms or or just behind locked doors. Maybe something moving so fast that one, either you're not seeing it at all move because it's right. just instantaneous. I, look, our eyes only get, I can't remember what it is, 14 images per second. It's its a rather slow frame rate right? comparatively. Right. And so that's why sleight of hand works. Why this works is that your eye is not that quick in picking up everything. So you miss a lot. And when this is happening, sometimes I see a blur. Sometimes I see a, this thing moving very slowly through the air. Sometimes right. not at all. Right. Another great aspect of this case is that you're really seeing maybe how the poltergeist sausage is made. Yeah, it's fascinating. Of course, like anything else, when this starts out and the news starts to get out that it's happening, she's treated poorly. Uh, Yoasha is treated like a hoaxer. And this is what often happens in these cases. And to be sure, there are plenty of poltergeist cases where that's been proven. There are cases where it's like, no, uh, people look away and the kid throws something people aren't paying attention. The family gets interested in it. Hoaxes happen. I mean, I don't know who remembers Balloon Boy, but a whole family can get behind a hoax. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, especially, oh, I want to have a reality TV show. But this predates that. I don't know. Maybe the earliest versions of uh, Real World on MTV were about to come out in 83. Oh, dear. Hmm? So one of these particular nights when all of the sounds are going on, and again, this is uh, this is actually April 4th, going back to the initial incident, the, the upstairs neighbors, the names were Jan and Gertrude Jach, uh-huh. J-A-C-H. They heard all the noise coming from downstairs, and they were like, what is going on with the Gajewski house? Yeah. And they, they're starting to think, oh, we're going to go down there. And no sooner do they go to do that, and the Gajewskis all come flying up the stairs to the upstairs neighbors. So now they're pounding on the door, trying to get into Jan and Gertruda's apartment. This is going to be Yoasha, Marion, her grandfather, and Ava, her mom. Now, I, I want to point out, too, that her mom is very easily upset by these activities that are happening. That continues for years. She never gets used to what's going on. 
with Yawasha, although Yawasha right. apparently starts to get sort of used to it. But anyway, they're like, let us in. They go into the apartment upstairs. And Jan Yak is the first person who was an eyewitness to anything. And he was actually interviewed in December of 1983 by the authors of the original version of the book, the Polish version of the book, who were there with him when a Japanese TV crew was there from Fuji Television. (laughs) You can always trust a Japanese television crew to take these things seriously and go investigate them wherever they are all over the world. You always... This was a big deal for Fuji TV. Apparently, one of the biggest companies in Japan, they came over and tried to capture all kinds of stuff. This was a big deal. They wanted to get to the bottom of this amazing case. Yeah. So in the interview, Jan Yak apparently said he woke up to these extremely loud sounds downstairs, couldn't figure it out. You know, the family's so quiet, like I said a few minutes ago. Then all three of them show up at the door and they came in and actually stayed with them. They wouldn't even go back to their own house. And Yak yeah. was like, this, he thought this was a prank. So he goes down and he looks into the uh, Gajewski home and he sees that everything is destroyed. It's just completely destroyed, yeah. ransacked, but nothing is actively flying around. It's just a bunch of detritus is what he sees when he looks in. Uh-huh. This was round one. Later, while they're still staying upstairs, he hears a bunch of noise. And then he goes downstairs and he saw things breaking and smashing against the wall. But then, and he's the first person to say this, it's something we just referenced a minute ago, things were moving so fast he couldn't see them in the air. Only after they shattered. And coming back to what you said about aportation, it's almost like these things are materializing just long enough to explode. And they're not actually necessarily going from point A to point B, right? at least in a linear fashion. And maybe they are, because it does seem like (laughs) most of the time, at least in these early cases, the objects are objects that were present in the home initially. Later, it seems like the objects aren't present. They're materializing and exploding, but they didn't necessarily come from the room that Yoash is in. But in this case, they are moving so fast that they can't be seen, which begs the question, are they moving fast at all? Are they Uh just popping in and out of existence and exploding when they pop back into existence. Right. Did you come across any instance where something was singed, burned, or melted? Yeah, there was one fire, but it wasn't necessarily connected to the aportation event. Right. It seemed to be a result of the implosion of a light bulb that led to an electrical fault. Yes, right. But that was just kind of like the nature of that particular moment of destruction and not necessarily a pattern in the events that there was fires. Like in the Sally house, take a drink, Mm -hmm. there was in the nursery (laughs) up there, right? There was a spontaneous fire that had uh, broken out near the window up there. There were fires all over that place. Yeah, uh, exactly. Toilet paper rolls lighting on fire. Or yeah, wads this of was, toilet that paper was not in happening hall. in this case. Yeah. Other things quickly to mention, to keep in mind, the remote from one house ends up in the new place and it's partially melted. Pens would show up partially melted. Right. This is a Sally house. When the Pickmans were living down the street, their TV yeah. remote vanished and turned up in the other house a half right. a block or, or, or a block or two away. Yeah. That's not happening here with the melting. No, it's not. Yeah. But where else that happened, if you don't like the Sally house, where else that happened is in the vertical plane, where I believe yeah. uh, it was a six pack. It was kind of like that plastic netting that goes around carrying a six pack in the UK. That just disappeared and showed up again, and the plastic casing was melted. The, uh, that's the netting right. was melted. So perhaps that's just a byproduct of going through this process where some things get singed, but we're not really seeing that. We are seeing things disappearing or just shattering or the elements of it. And uh, like I said, it can go through a a wall or a locked space. And uh, so it is a form of aportation perhaps, which is different than most of the times you hear about a poltergeist stuff, which is usually just stuff flying off shelves. Yeah. Got that too, but this is so much more and seen by so many more people. And for folks who haven't heard of that, The Vertical Plane, one of my favorite series we've done. So look for that in our back catalog. If you haven't heard it, it's uh, it's very cool. But yeah. uh, So anyway, another thing that Jan witnessed, I think this is the first time that he really witnessed something super tangible, was he witnessed a book flying across the room. And this was, again, in their apartment. It landed under a sideboard, and Yoasha was in there. She picked it up, and she put it on a desk, another piece of furniture in the room, and then it flew off again and landed under the sideboard again. Yak said that when that happened, they were all 10 feet away from where the book was. Mm -hmm. And this is something about this I want to get into. I'm especially going to get into this with Brandon and also Dr. Horan when when they come on the show. There's a lot of things that are eyewitness accounts in this. And the skeptical part of me had some issues with certain things about this story. 
But there's some of the eyewitness accounts, or actually a lot of them are by scientists and researchers and lots of folks who are watching things and in a scientific environment, but also with the eyewitnesses. In this case, Yak is saying, no, the book, nobody was near it. It was 10 feet away. It flew across the room. Yoasha saw it. He saw it. Maybe Ava was there. Maybe Andre, that her dad was there, but maybe not. He worked all the time. A lot of times they had to call him at work and be like, come home. Everything's flying mm-hmm. around. So there was these cases where it's like, well, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. And when it's, when there's as much of it as eyewitness stuff that we, I know that makes skeptics nervous. It makes people yeah. worry. Well, it's like, oh, well, they're mistaken, which is the thing that people immediately go to. And I don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now about the eyewitness accounts have to be completely discounted. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Like th- right. that argument is something we can have later, but it's compelling. Do we know who Jan Yak is? And is he reliable to say, oh, I was 10 feet away. Does he know what 10 feet is? Does he know where the book was? Does, does, is there any chance? Because in the cases of, and I don't have specific evidence of specific poltergeist stories to fall back on, but I feel like I remember reading about them over the years where the people that were perpetrating you know, the telekinesis yeah. were just really good at flinging something when people weren't looking. Like, really good at it. Like, just, you know. Yeah. Or, well, I mean, again, one of the earliest stories, you know, the Fox sisters. Yes, yeah. When you hit the wrapping. It's always with the wrapping. Yeah. With the, you know, they accused uh, Betsy Bell of fabricating some of this, and then then the whole family has to be in on it for some weird reason. <laughs> and yes, folks, people with strange ideas do like attention, whether it's good or bad, and sometimes it's detrimental and upsetting, they probably wish it would stop, but they initiated it because uh, for some, uh, well, you look at uh, Munchausen's by proxy, people wanting attention through horrible beans. Yeah. Then uh, maybe that's a possibility, but in these other cases, you look at the Fox sisters, and I mean, here's what's weird about that story is that, yeah, one, they had an apple on a string. They would thump that on the floor. Right. One of the sisters was uh, accused of, or I guess admitted, she was very good at cracking her toes or something like that, and, and would cause sounds and pops and raps. Right. And so there's a little bit of sleight of hand going on, and they wanted the attention. Years later, of course, that created a huge rift in their in their sideshow. Years later, the, one of them recanted uh, having done that. Or there's a combination of both, and that's the thing. They're not mutually exclusive. You can fake some of the stuff, and some of the stuff can be real. Right. So uh, another case, of course, people are going to want us to talk about is the Enfield poltergeist, where the famous photo where you see the girls flying through the air, it's like, well, that was just snap when they all jumped. Right. And it's just a flash photograph. And then I think uh, Harry, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the investigators, was caught by BBC television with pebbles in his pockets. Right. Sometimes it happens, but again, it could be something real. You have a combination of that plus something faked or something totally faked or something totally real. That's our total scale. With we don't everything. know what we don't everything know. Everything we talk about. You're getting all about. Rumsfeld yes. on me. Yeah, okay. People well, think that's one or the other because that's an easy way to put that aside and, and to rest saying like, well, we found this one thing, so all of it's got to be faked. Right. And sometimes that is the case, but there are these other logical possibilities. So the other thing about that's unique about this case, I think, is that it goes on for so long. Yes. And is seen by so many more people. They don't just get Michigan J frogged. Yeah. They actually are able to see these things for their own eyes. And I wonder if this were in the United States with more U.S. documentation in the way that we did in the mid-80s, just video cameras, people with VHSC camcorders and whatnot, getting more taped evidence of this stuff and recording it, if that would cause a difference of opinion, perhaps with our audience tonight. So just all things to keep in mind. But again, you either have to discount all of the testimonies here and the anecdotes and uh, the clinical case study and and laboratory conditions that were conducted and throw that all out, plus the professional opinions as well as the laypersons, throw it all out to totally dismiss this. And I think it's very hard to do in this case, whereas, yeah, the Fox sisters, long time ago, right, mid-19th century, right, easier to dismiss. So again, on the 4th, after Andre actually left work in the middle of his shift to come home, which in the book it says is very difficult for him to do that, which you can imagine if it's a factory or, or mm-hmm. whatever, it's, you know, people got to be there. He comes home, he goes upstairs and gets the family from the Yak apartment. And as soon as they come down inside back into their own apartment, a stoneware pot flies across two rooms, 
usually this is from the kitchen to what they call the parlor. Now, I don't, I never saw a floor plan for their place, but it, it shattered a mirror on the sideboard or a piece of glass on the sideboard and exploded into pieces right in front of all of them. So again, that was all April 4th, 1983. They start talking to local authorities. They want to get it investigated. I don't know why it's, it's weird to me. You're always like, oh, let's call the police. What are you going to do? Arrest a ghost? I don't know. But they like, <laughs> let's call somebody in. Yeah. And uh, they call a doctor. The doctor was like, oh, well, Yoasha's mentally ill. And the cops didn't believe it. They're like, yeah, whatever. We don't have time for this. The neighbors, the other people that are living in the building, not necessarily the, the yaks who took them in, but other people were like, God, it's so loud. This is ridiculous. It's keeping us awake. What's happening? Get these people out of here. Andres finally convinces the cops to investigate. They hadn't done that because they were convinced it was a hoax. Uh, so a couple of officers come in and I think stay the night or stay for a day and uh, see nothing. On the second day, a police sergeant comes in named Tadoj Slovic. And he is on site when Yawasha comes home from the doctor. And when as soon as she comes into the house, things start flying around. Small objects, glasses, screws, things like that. And he sees them defy physics. And they are exhibiting uh, something you just said a few minutes ago. And one of my favorite things I haven't been able to say in a long time, non-ballistic motion. <laughs> objects are changing direction in midair. Yes, and he's actually seeing them flying again from the kitchen to the parlor. This was a pattern that came up a lot, apparently, in right. their first unit. And I, I don't understand how that was laid out. I wish we had a map of their apartment. Well, think about that. If, if that is true, that's yeah. not something that you could do faking it by flinging things with exactly. levers and you cannot, strings. Yeah. Right. It's, it's hard enough to throw a curveball in baseball. You can't. Let's say that Yoasha is flinging this stuff or, like you said, strings or it's some kind of hoax. How do you get it to change course midair? or alter course in the midair, and and you can't do that. Still, we're talking about eyewitness testimony here. We don't have pictures of this. We don't have video of this. But we do have a police sergeant who went in incredulous saying, no, this is happening. I saw it happening. And the official police report said, quote, there is inexplicable physical phenomena happening and spontaneous movement of objects, end quote. So that's an official report on what the officers are seeing there. Now, I guess at some point they called in an engineer or an architect who said, oh, the building's settling, and that's causing things to fly around. The, the walls are cracking. And I always love these kinds of exp – I, I don't understand <laughs> what people are thinking when they – oh, the building's settling. And that caused all of the <laughs> kitchenware on this one unit to go crazy and hit the wall. It's like, really? That's like so much more absurd than, than yeah. what it might be if it was a ghost. Well, like, Scott, I, that's the owl's version of this stupid. explanation. Yeah. And because yeah. it, is the building settling like on its side? Yeah. <laughs> so everything in the entire building is falling to one wall. The uh, point but that's is, all you got. it is a mining community. There's probably right. lots of caverns or there's things underneath or maybe well, people I can understand are, the rattling. You know, yeah. Or there's, um, yeah, they're blowing things up nearby or whatever. But it, nevertheless, they call people in. They did inspections. No cracks found in the walls. Nothing. I guess eventually some engineer was actually on site when he saw a jar of mustard and a bottle fly from the kitchen into the parlor and smash against the wall with glass fragments instead of falling to the ground, flying back towards Yoasha's hands. That's another thing to keep in mind. She's not immune from this or safe from this either. A lot of times she is also getting the blows and the attacks. Yeah. And then there's a lot of flying glass, as you said. Uh, glass is one thing that uh, shards of pottery, shards of glass she is also in harm's way with yeah. a lot of this activity. So uh, is that part of it with her mental illness? She's self-harming or is it something that's just kind of uncontrollable, but she's the conduit. So I just went through all my tax expenses, like a lot of folks recently, and I also went through my old tax data, and boy, was it cringy. Oh, yeah? What made you cringe? <laughs> Aside from all the usually cringy data, and just because it's income tax time, I looked over my old expenses, and seeing what I used to pay for my mobile phone service made me queasy. Ugh, I know what you mean. Throwing good money after bad can have a visceral effect on your well-being. Oh, yeah. But like I've told you before, you can't beat yourself up too much because Mint Mobile didn't exist back then. With their brilliant plan of cutting out the middlemen, the overpriced wireless companies have to pay, like right. for building towers and retail stores, so they can pass those sweet, sweet savings on to <laughs> you, the consumer. <laughs> yeah, I guess they didn't have that business model way back when either. Just the idea that if they control the means of production as well as the delivery service, they could charge whatever they want. I mean, who are you going to call? 
Well, I mean, you could call your friends and family, but you had no choice if you wanted to do that with mobile unless you went to them. And what we're still finding is that there's always a catch in the fine print with the old companies. And that's the great thing about Mint Mobile. With such low prices, like for a limited time, all Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, you're probably thinking there's got to be a catch. But trust us, there isn't one. Nope, just high-quality premium wireless service for an affordable price. I know it sounds impossible these days. Great service, a fair price, humbug. But Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online. It's quality service you deserve at a secret sauce that won't give you heartburn. Time to say bye bye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. Don't let another year go by with paying too much. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Hi, this is Randy from Vancouver Island, Canada, and you are listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. So eventually, I guess the police actually advised them to move out. I want to read this excerpt from uh, page five of the book, The Elusive Force, which was uh, our research reference for this. Quote, in view of this situation, the architect advised the municipal authorities that the Gajewskis would need other lodgings at once. This decision was also made personally by the deputy mayor of Sosnoviet, Josef Stankovitz, who subsequently gave his reasons for it in a press interview. Quote, of course, we didn't take such an incredible story at face value. A police officer and a municipal government employee were posted in the Gajewskis' apartment around the clock. We saw with our own eyes that the reports had been true. Objects, particularly ones made of glass, really did move in the child's direction. If only out of concern for her health and safety, we felt obligated to do everything in our power to help those people. Well, at least you're getting some sound advice by the authorities. Just just get out of there. (laughs) You know what's happening, but we believe something's happening. You're not just hoaxing this. Otherwise, we'd, uh, we'd fine you for disturbing your neighbors. Something quickly, though, a pattern that we're seeing here, it reminded me when uh, we were talking about her... Yoasha being the target or victim of this activity, is that she would get sick quite a bit with a high fever that would spike during these periods of activity and then quickly resolve itself or her temperature would go back down. So she had some tremendous physical effects with this, but the sickness that would continue on, often debilitating, also reminded me of a lot of people who experience paranormal activity or years of it or something very strange happening in their lives. Yeah. Our friend, Johnny L. Tenney, who <laughs> he, he was so ill, he, he was kept home for a whole year uh, from school. And I think his classmates uh, thought he died. Yeah. <laughs> if I remember right. that, uh, that account correctly, where a lot of people that have had strange things happen to them later on had a bout of sickness or infirmity that kept them at home in some way. And so I find that fascinating that uh, not all the time, of course, but just uh, sometimes maybe more often than should be, there is something going on with the person in their youth that is like sickness or something debilitating. Edgar Casey, I, I think as well. Yeah. I don't know if that's the sequestering, the sickness here. As I said, the authorities at first thought or the disbelievers thought that she was mentally ill. There's something wrong with her physically, yeah. psychosomatically. There was something causing this her to behave this way, but not in a unseen force kind of way. Right. Just that, oh, she's causing this. This is crazy. And the family is weird because they've smashed all their possessions now. Right. And they keep doing it. Uh, What's wrong with them? With other uh, people, though, there's somebody also in history, and I keep forgetting, I don't know if it was Charles Fort, but he, uh, there was somebody else who had long terms of sickness and later went on to experience quite extraordinary things later in life. So anyway, just a little bit of an aside, but keep that in mind. She's, uh, this is like the sparkling, the static that happens. 
she yeah. gets this high fever and then it it kind of quickly passes but it's often very debilitating to her and she needs to rest and relax after these yeah at this point now word is actually starting to get out reporters are coming out of the woodwork and unfortunately some journalist apparently doxed their home address Ugh, and then yeah. just the onslaught was crazy there's people outside the building are showing up they're trying to interview them all kinds of what I called freaks and geeks are showing up. We got exorcists, cult members, psychics, uh, all sorts of folks are like, we want to participate in this. It's It sort of reminds you, I mean, we always come back to this, but that scene at the conference table in Close Encounters, just like everybody <laughs> coming out of the woodwork, you know. Uh -huh. And and the family was Catholic by nature, but they weren't particularly devout. Uh, they described the home as not really having any Catholic uh, right. artifacts or relics or any any sort of artwork in it, but they did declare themselves to be a Catholic family. There was a priest that they had called over, uh, a father to try and bless the house. And there was a rumor that the aspergillum, you know, that holds the holy water was knocked out of his hand <laughs> while he was there. Yeah. But in the book, it unequivocally says that's a rumor. That never happened. Right, right. He never, right. you know, there's, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff happening, which we've seen in legends we've reported on before, all sort of made up details. I had to look this up again, but it's a, it's a kind of a rod, kind of fancy ball on the end yes. that has uh, holes in it that you, you'll see uh, pre-sprinkle. It's either that or a, a a collection of branches, but they will dip that in the holy water and sprinkle people. And I just purchased a uh, OXO brand tea ball, which looks yeah. like the same thing. It's oh. a ball on the end with little holes in it that uh, I don't oh, douse. Uh, I infuse tea with that. But anyway, that's, <laughs> as you were pointing to, I think I the larger- pizza cutters. Uh, they make very good products. Uh, I really much like their industrial design. The, the, the idea to keep in mind here is that uh, as you, I think I saw in, in some of your notes yeah. in the outline, with these stories of strange happenings, there's a lot of things that get mixed up that are yes. just flights of fancy within yeah. the true story. Yeah. And a little bit of powdered sugar in the story donut, just to kind of sweeten it up to make people uh, ooze and ahs and kind of make people believe it. But again, it doesn't discount all of it. Well, and I think there's another component to remember here, and it's hard, and people don't ever really consider this kind of thing. But if you're an eyewitness to something like this, you've never seen anything like this in your life, and it completely blows you away, and you're actually in the scenario, then the odds are pretty good you're in shock when this happens. Or you right. go into shock right after it happens. You're in a full state of disbelief. And then when you relay it, you're almost naturally going to exaggerate the scenario. You're going to do it. It's just like when people say, you know, they see a car crash and they're like, no, this guy was going 100 miles an hour. It's like, well, he was going 35 <laughs> and a 25. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the guy over here ran the stop sign. And it's like, well, maybe he did. Maybe he just rolled through it. And that's the whole problem with the eyewitness thing and people being like, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. It makes it real hard to get at the root of it. But as we always say, and we always go back, it's like when we talk about the Pied Piper of Hamlin and or we talk about these other stories, somewhere down there at the bottom, there mm -hmm. is a root to this story. Yeah. There is a seed there. And then when something is happening over and over and over and lots and lots of people are having that experience, then there's no question that something is going on. And then I know what the skeptics are saying is like, well, yeah, I'll tell you what's going on. It's a hoax. And well, so, right. but then when you say to them, well, these eyewitnesses said this book was 10 feet away from them and it flew across the room or this heavy piece of furniture moved and she was no sitting across the room on a bed in a blanket or whatever, that kind of stuff. Or right. these uh, junction boxes had the metal was ripped off the top of them. You'd need a ladder to get up to them. And it was done in the course of 20 seconds while people were looking away. There's yeah. a lot of that kind of stuff with this case. And, we, you know, and we'll, and we'll get to more of it in a second, but that is the stuff where it's like, oh God, but it's all just, it's anecdotal. It's anecdotal evidence, you know? Yeah. And it's, so is it how <laughs> it's anecdotal? Is it? Yeah. That's what a friend of mine is uh, saying okay. about the economy, but, um, <laughs> and I'm strongly disagreeing <laughs> yeah. with him, but, uh, all so, right. but th that's the point is like, there's a lot to consider there anyway. So as they're looking again for more and more, uh, reasons about why this might happen, they, uh, they brought this woman in from the Radiesthesia Association in Glavitsa. Yeah. And she said, well, there's water running along the wall of the building, and that's causing objects to fly around, and that Yawasha amplified that somehow. Now, this is a person that believes in telekinetics a little bit, and energy flow, yeah. and dowsing, and that sort of thing. But that was her theory, except the only problem was they couldn't find any water running anywhere outside the building. So even that, which is a far out theory, yeah. there was nothing to back it up. But the other thing is, they move out, and when they do, it stops. And not only that, it follows them to their next residence. So the water running along the building is, it, even if there was water, that's disproven by the fact that it's following Yoasha wherever she lives. 
Right. It, it, and uh, and for those of you who have uh, not really heard of radiesthesia, I didn't much either. Uh, it's uh, generally described as some ability for people to detect radiation or energy being emitted by a person. Uh, it could be an object, could be an animal, or some land feature, some geographical item here. And that's a sensitivity of something that is kind of unseen, but being able to be sensed by another human being. So it it lives in that realm of, I guess, psychic ability or sensing, but is generally considered uh, by the mainstream as pseudoscience. So now the authors are trying to figure out how to investigate this. And one thing that they also point out about it is that what's happening to Yoasha happens day or night, in the darkness, in the light. Doesn't matter if she's asleep, she's awake, she's feeling sick. Sometimes she's in a good mood and it's still happening. Mm -hmm. There's not always the sound, but sometimes there's the clicking resembling the finger snapping. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it didn't seem like she had any conscious control over it, which I thought was really fascinating. When I was looking at this part of the book, I actually had a thought about Yoda and the X-Wing and the and <laughs> this is something yeah. too, and I, and I wish Rich was here too, because I, I was thinking about Titans, one of the more recent shows that he worked for, with these young superheroes who don't have quite full control of their powers or the ability yeah. to recognize how to use them. Or if anyone's seen the movie Looper and the Rainmaker, I don't want to spoil anything there, but right. there's this idea that there's these characters that have these powers and don't really know how to manage them, which is something I want to come back to as we get to the theories of this. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Because there is a point at which Yoasha does get up tight, described later in the book, and, yeah. and it's like, I'll show them. Which is, you know, that's like, if that's not the movie line you want to hear from the person who's making <laughs> stuff fly around, well, I'll show you, you know, I'm going to crush your skull from over here, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So there is a little bit, you know, it doesn't matter not how big the X-Wing is. You can lift it or not, you know, if you, you know, judge me by my size, do you? Sorry. <laughs> so my question is. You're not doing the voice. Yeah, I know. Osway, I didn't want to do uh, that. I won't. I, I won't put you on the spot for that. Judge me by my size, do you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> well, it, look, it, it's, uh, I think it's tendency, uh, there is a tendency for dramatic interpretations and presentations of that kind of power. Yeah. You got to put your hand up. Right? Yes, you do got to put your hand up. Yeah. You got to, yeah. you got to, right. You got to direct the force. Well, I don't think that really has to happen. Right. Like in Carrie, remember the movie, uh, the Stephen King, uh, and novel, yeah. uh, she just looks or she's covered in uh, pig's blood at the prom and she just gives a look over and suddenly psychokinetic shenanigans are happening. Right. Here, there's no focus perhaps, but there is a subconscious connection, I believe, to a story that you're going to get to here in a minute uh, where there is a, uh, I'm talking about a dream that happens. Yeah. And it, one of the things that she frequently says is she doesn't usually remember her dreams, but right. there was one case where a hairbrush violently flew across a room and she confessed that she had had a dream where she had gotten a really bad haircut and she was angry <laughs> about it. Yeah. So maybe there was a connection there. There, There's another right. case later where she was at school, and this was one of the only things that happened at school that they could really point their fingers to. People are like, oh, there's this stuff happening. But talk about an environment with the other kids and like people just sort of thinking things are happening and there weren't. But there was this yeah. one specific thing, according to the authors of the book, and it's one thing I like about the, the way they wrote the book. They're like, we're not going to say... If we can't say pretty definitively that this was an event, we're not going to say that this happened. We're not going to give credence to every little thing right, that right. somebody saw. But there was one particular point where she was late for a class or something, and she was outside the classroom door hesitating to go inside because she was late. And then right yes. when she grabbed the door handle, a flower pot inside the classroom she was going into, I think, fell off a shelf. Yes. Just yeah. fell off the shelf, like right when she was going in there. And that was witnessed by several people. And so they know what happened. And there were eyewitnesses they could talk to about it. And maybe that was a manifestation of stress she was having about about being late into that classroom. So right. that's something interesting. But the, the other thing, too, that was happening, uh, we talked about how fast things were moving. They didn't always move that fast. I want to uh, read this excerpt. This is actually from page eight of The Elusive Force. Some objects, however, did fly slowly and were perfectly visible, such as a cup of unfinished tea left in the kitchen. First, it glided into Yoasha's bedroom, leaving behind a trail of spilled liquid, then veered into the parlor. As if this were not enough, some accounts contain details that defy analysis, e.g. the spontaneous unscrewing of faucets, the overturning of a heavy sewing machine that spun in circles, 
and the winding of the cord of an unoperated vacuum cleaner across the floor. So I think it's interesting the things that are going slowly. And uh, later, I think this, the, uh, the tea, I don't know if it's the same incident, but there was a point in which a teacup was moved slowly through the air and the tea stayed in the cup. Yeah. And they actually get into this later in the book in the appendices, which is more of a part two discussion. When they start talking about the physics of this and they're like, right. well, if she's controlling subconsciously, because it doesn't seem like she's doing anything consciously, is controlling the atom somehow, and right. they're having a consistent G-force, and the tea in the teacup is not spilling for the same reason that it doesn't spill when it's on your tray table on the airplane. Yeah, right. So It's all moving at the same speed. Right. So there's the, the entire unit. Yes. Yeah. And there's another time she was hooked up to an EKG machine during all the testing they were doing on her later, and the glass on the control panel cracked while it was hooked up to her. Now that's a movie shot. Yeah, that that's is a definitely. movie scene. Right. Um, <laughs> right. So um, again, most doctors are labeling Yoasha as mentally ill and Andre and Ava as hoaxers. That's what people are thinking. But by the same token, people are seeing things that they cannot explain and they still don't accept them. And, and this reminds me of um, people uh, seeing some of the crazy things that happened in, the, uh, in that true story that inspired The Exorcist, which is another series we did, the actual story that inspired the, the script and the movie and the story there, where they were witnessing this child like walk up a wall and backflip off of a ceiling. Yeah. Slowly, though. Slowly, yeah. And so folks are just, <laughs> yeah. they, and they, when they see this, there's some people that just, because they can't wrap their head around it, they will still, they will look at something like that and be like, oh, this is a hoax. That didn't really happen. I was mistaken. And then it comes back to the paranormal apathy. We always talk about like after, it's almost like the shock you go into. It's like, what did I just see? Did I see a UFO? And oh, I got to get to the grocery store. I'm out of peanut butter. Like that kind of <laughs> thing. It's just, it, there's something very strange about that. And it's a blind yeah. spot. Latoya Amon, that's Demon House. It's yeah. Zach's uh, documentary on that house. Yeah. The thing that was kind of documented at least, uh, yeah, I think by the family. And well, there was a social worker that came to the hospital to examine the son, and that's the one where, during the interview by the social worker, the uh, the young boy starts walking up the side of the wall, and he does a flip oh, over right. the head right. of yeah the that's social worker. That's what I think I'm thinking of. As opposed okay, to the, yes, yeah. and then the social worker just quickly leaves the room and never comes back and yeah, leaves I'm good. that case. I'm good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's probably what I'd be like. Okay, that happened. I'm going to go sit on the beach and like draw a seagull. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, so eventually this, uh, this group comes in called the, uh, the Polish Biosynodic Society, the PBS. They actually started up the same year that this unfolded. This was a group of uh, very well-educated people, and they were experts in psychotronics, which is essentially a Polish version of parapsychology. And they studied uh, bioenergy therapy. There was uh, Professor Lech Radonofsky went there in April 83 to see Yoasha, and he tried to determine if there was magnetic fields around her. And one of the things that they figured out was that they were they, they couldn't effectively measure that stuff. And the, mm -hmm. the experiment also led them to discover that when she would stretch her arms out and people got within 20 centimeters of her, which is yeah. pretty close, they would feel weird like weak. Weak, yeah. Yeah, so talk yeah. about the forest. Talk about raising the X-wing <laughs> out of the swamp. You know, you're right. You're a battery sponge. You're yeah. you're an electromagnetic. Well, like batteries dying during uh, paranormal investigations and on Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, there's an energy transfer of sorts happening. Here's another thing that's happening with her. She appears to have ESP, like a sophisticated mm -hmm. high level of ESP. And this was I did just have a um a huge pile of stuff framed, including some really amazing <laughs> posters that you gave me, some Bob Lazar uh. stuff. Uh, I'll yeah. share pictures when that stuff gets done. It's going to take months. I took 11 pieces to a frame store, wow. and then uh, now I yeah. wish I had arranged financing. But anyway, <laughs> one of the things I was having framed was, you yeah. know, I had a vintage uh, Kreskin's ESP game. Yes. And it was pretty trash, so I took it and had uh, some pieces of it framed. And uh, But when I was oh. a kid, I played this game. Right. And uh, you have, like, the cards with the geometric shapes and a little pendulum and mm -hmm. very cool. ESP, extrasensory perception, which is its own thing, and maybe it should be its own show, but there is this point in which you're trying to identify geometric shapes. It's not too different from what the kid is doing in Ghostbusters when Bill Murray shocks him and chewing gum flies out of his mouth. Even though he's <laughs> guessing the, the shapes right, you hold the card up, it's got a square, it's got four circles, yeah. it's got a triangle, it's got a couple of wavy lines, and he's like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and the gum comes out. So, the cards. The Z, yeah, the cards. Wait, what are those? So, wait, what are those uh, uh, they the have zap, a name, um, those cards. Um, yes. 
Uh, but now I can't remember. And I was just I was just looking at the Kreskin set, and I can't remember what the name was. But uh, she was well, you're really. Not gonna, you're not going to look that up. <sighs> All right, I'll look it up. Zapf. It's uh, yeah. I'm, you're close. I'm, sorry, I'm blanking too. Yes, it's the uh, Zener cards. The Zener cards. Yeah, it's pretty. And what the you know? Here's the other really th- amazing thing about Kreskin because this board yes. game, like I have, it, it seems really old. I feel like it's from the 70s. And when you see these pictures of him on it holding a yes. pendulum, which is what I'm having framed. And he looks like maybe he's in his in those pictures, I think, in his late forties or something. This guy's still yeah. with us. Kreskin is still around. Uh, he lives in New that's Jersey. So cool. yeah. yeah, I guess he's <laughs> around. Like I I he I would he's 89 years old, so pretty amazing. But um yeah. anyway, what happened with Yoasha was that they would pick different subjects and they're asking uh these people to transmit these images to Yoasha, and in one case, she's correctly identifies eight out of 12 of the geometric shapes that are being sent yeah. to her. And what would happen was she described this, and I thought this was really fascinating because the people that can do this don't always describe what they, how they do it, but she was saying that the shape that was the answer would become larger, warmer, and more pleasant to her, I guess, in her mind's eye. So that's yeah. pretty fascinating. Uh, but she did that several times with lots of people over the years, and she always significantly outpaced the law of averages with being able to determine what shapes the people were seeing. So that's interesting. I'm Chantel from Victoria, BC, and you're listening to Astonishing Legends. Now let's get back to the show. So here's another thing, and this is one of the things that I, I honestly can't wait again to ask uh, Brandon and uh, Dr. Horan about is this, this spoon bending. There's a lot of spoon bending, <laughs> and this well, is just going to be a red oh flag for skeptics, and I don't blame them because this is almost its own show. We've never covered Uri Geller. We probably should. He's the most famous spoon bender probably in the history of spoon bending. And, you know, he's the reason that you have that scene in the matrix. Do not try and bend the spoon with your mind. That is impossible. Yeah. Instead, only try and realize the truth. So, uh, there is you no know spoon. that that, uh, well, I guess that's the truth. Yeah. We're living in a hologram. Did you know that the actor who played that character yeah. of the, uh, did the spoon bender, his name is Rowan. Oh, his name is Rowan, which is my son's name. Yeah. So there you go. Very well, there cool. You go. So yeah. he got very famous for bending spoons. Yes. He went around the world, like doing all these shows. He was on talk shows where he would bend spoons on the air and keys and do different kinds right. of psychic ESP type things. And then in 1978, Johnny Carson, for you kids who don't remember, who was the original king of late night uh-huh. he like if you went on his show your career was made or in this case it was unmade because he had uri geller on <laughs> and he had him come out and then he yeah. had him ambushed essentially by the amazing randy or james randy who was a significantly talented uh magician who right. made it his business to debunk people who were pretending to have supernatural or paranormal powers when really all they were doing was exercising sleight of hand because he also went on to look at faith healers he was interested yes, he did. in. I mean, he wrote Pop a off. book about Yuri Geller because they know how the sausage is made. That's the twice I've said in the show. Yes, how really, you're saying made. it too much lately. The idea being is that he he knows how, well, I mean, here's the thing. Joe Nickel performs stage magic. These yeah. guys know how these things can be fake. So listen, they're telling you they're doing stage magic. Yeah. When somebody is putting one over on people and also for monetary gain, they feel it's their duty to uh, show you how these things happen. Randy's books about Geller originally was published as The Truth About Uri Geller and then right. later uh, republished as The Magic of Uri Geller in 1975. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, 1982, because yes, right. Randy got sued by Geller, but never had to pay him anything because he won in court. All right, so Geller, uh, Randy was out there. And he, Carson, had him come out because he figured that Geller was doing sleight of hand, sat him down, and he had all the spoons that he was supposed to bend already on the table and some other things. And Geller essentially could not perform at all, unable to do anything for 20 minutes. He just essentially made to look completely foolish on the air. And it was the beginning. There's sort of an urban legend that, no, he stayed famous after that or his fame went on, and it's not necessarily true. It, it, he sort of he downslid there. He's still around. He's still, he lives in uh, Tel Aviv now. He's still in the circles. He is yeah. 
Uh, something that uh, James Randi said also in that clip, if you remember, is that it didn't, even when he was quote unquote exposed or he had a, a major failing. Now, Uri Geller makes an appearance in Third Eye Spies, uh, Las yes. Munia. Terrific documentary, by the way. And he is still kind of roaming around these circles. And in this clip, James Randi himself says, like, it didn't, weirdly, it didn't seem to decrease his popularity all that much. Now, his reputation, sure took a major yeah. hit because yeah. it was a moment. And as we know, look, you can get under pressure. You can have a bad day. So in this case though, he felt pressure because what James Randi said, like he, he wasn't on actually, if you look at the clip, he's sitting next to Ricardo Montalban Khan, and from fantasy <laughs> Island. Uh, look him up kids. Uh, so that was the other guest on the panel there on Carson and, and Johnny's very nice. He's very, he says, I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but what James Randi said, like, I get us a selection uh, of items and make I sure. I beg to differ. Johnny oh, you think... was polite, but he knew what he was doing. No, no, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. But I'm, I'm saying. just he, saying he was... was not being nice. I mean, this he, oh, he no, designed well, this to completely destroy Uri Geller. Well, here's the thing. I think it was totally fair because. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not saying it wasn't fair. I'm just telling you that Johnny didn't do that out of the kindness of his heart. It's yeah. good TV either way. Yeah. But it, if you've seen the old show, if you're that old. When they cut to commercial, they would, you know, play a little music. Tommy Newsom would play some music. And then there would be that card, like, more to come. Yeah. Like, stay tuned. And then they would go to commercial. They do that. And it's just dead quiet in the audience. And like, yeah. like oh, boy. Yeah. Because he was kind of a popular thing. So it is a weird, awkward moment. But I think a fair presentation of what Randy said is, you know, have your staff prepare some items. Keep them totally away from Uri and his people. Yeah. At all times. They shouldn't yeah. be near them because... Randy goes on to explain how the spoon bending trick is done. Yes. He's like, look, you know, you can bend a key. Basically yeah. what the, the trick is, is you show up with a bent key. And right. by the way you hold it into the perception of the eye or the camera, it can look straight. And as you start to turn it, it looks like it's bending under your thumb. Right. Now, how do you do that? Well, you can, you can show up with a bent key. As he said, you could drop the key and I just rolled over it with my chair, which is what I did, you know? Yeah. But here's the thing. Is that what Uri did? All the other times, did he show up with his own spoons? Did he show up with his own bent, pre-bent keys? What I'm pointing out, and I have a quote here that I wrote down because I liked it so much yeah. from James Randi, is that you'd, so he says, well, you can pre-bend these. Look, it, but it takes a lot of pre-bending. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Right. So you have to show up with a very weakened spoon. And that's, that's how he says this is happening. And then you can do the rubbing and it looks like the spoon's bending and then eventually it breaks. Yeah. It's very effective. Now, he does not say specifically here that that's what Uri was doing. No, he says specifically he could have done it this way. Here's the quote then that I liked. Yeah. This isn't proof positive that other demonstrations aren't the result of supernatural power, but isn't this more of a reasonable explanation? Yeah. What I like about that is that he's leaving the door open for the possibility, as I see it, that this could be from supernatural power. He says, uh, again, this isn't proof positive. Yeah. But to him, it's not very likely at all. I think that's fair. And also, it's not saying that he believes in the supernatural power. He's, I think, doing the fair thing and saying, well, we don't know. This isn't proof that something else isn't happening. But isn't it more likely that Yuri showing up with bent, pre-bent spoons? My thing of like, if you don't know what it is, you can't say what it isn't. Randy is not saying he knows how it's happening. Right. But he is saying... He knows one way that it could happen, essentially. Now, to wind this all back again, real this in, is Yoasha showing up with bent spoons? Well, she goes to laboratory conditions where these tests are performed. There's also metallurgy involved. That doesn't seem to be the case here. She's not showing up with bent keys and spoons and, and preloading magician's tricks. And that's something I'm not sure of, Forrest. And again, this is a question for, uh, I'm wondering if uh, Brandon and uh, Dr. Horan are mm -hmm. going to know this, but like, it's not clearly indicated in the book anywhere that I could see, except for in one instance that I saw right. where the spoons came from. But you're right. So they do say, oh, we did this in scientific conditions, but they don't list the conditions. And they don't say, oh, well... We did the same thing Johnny Carson did to Yuri right. Geller. Because also, yeah. by the way, that was eight years earlier. So they knew that that happened at this point. They yeah. knew about Uri Geller in Poland and with this story specifically. So that didn't happen after that. That happened way almost 10 years before this story happened. So you would mm -hmm. think that the scientists would have at the very least prepared it in the same way for her. I want to believe 
that she was not allowed access to the spoons before this happened. Mm -hmm. People saw the spoons and other cutlery flying through the house, bent in all different directions, but it also wasn't just spoons. It was a big, thick piece of uh, communications cable that had Mm -hmm. like 25 or 30 copper strands in it. It looked like it was an inch and a half around. Incredibly hard to bend. She like tied that in a bow or something somehow. There were the spoons, which you see pictures of. There were pots and pans, which you can see pictures of in the book. Um, that are just completely smashed and other things that were happening so fast that there wouldn't even be time to manipulate them in that way or pre-prepare them. So it it does seem like that. But for me, and I think people think that the skeptic in me died in the Sally house, but it's still there. (laughs) It's not gone. Mm -hmm. The bent spoon thing is a bit of a red flag carnival sideshow vibe to it to me. And that's part of the thing with all of this stuff. It's like, All these different things are happening, and I get a weird feeling about that. Like about, okay, stuff flying around the room, great. What else is happening? Well, stuff flying around the room. Also, she can predict cards. She has a psychic Mm -hmm. ability, seemingly completely unrelated to me. I don't know how the paranormal stuff's working, but it's like, okay, so now we're going from telekinesis to reading other people's minds to the parlor trick of bending metal or bending things that shouldn't be able to be bent easily. It's just a little bit of a like, you know, you buy your ticket and you go in the tent and at each little table, these different things are happening. It's like a little side showy. That's just something that my gut is like, why is it this weird collection of things? You know, I, I, it just feels, it's almost like it'd be easier for me if she's just moving stuff with her mind. Like, okay, Let's focus on that. As Are I'm, you getting hung up on the fact that it, it is that common item of a spoon? Yeah, I'm getting hung up on something about <laughs> you would rather it. And it was I'm, I'm going to be, I'm with the people that are going to listen to the show and be like, oh my God, this spoon thing, Uri Geller is a big fake and all that. Mm-hmm, and I don't know mm-hmm. whether he is or not. I hear you on what you're saying. And yes, Randy was like, oh, I'm not vouching. Listen, I'm not, uh, I'm not personally vouching for anybody, including no, 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 Mr. And neither Randy. Am I. What I'm saying is though, is that I think what you're talking about, and maybe what you're experiencing here, sir, you tell me, yeah, is that yeah. it is more so a sociological phenomenon of the, the reason why James Randi seems to be baffled that Uri Geller's, uh, Uri Geller's popularity did not wane or was yeah. like totally dismissed after yeah. this. It's because we like to see that kind of stuff. Well, we yeah, like likes to Barbara Walters shit. having him on and, yeah. and him guessing her drawings. Yeah. We like to see him on Carson. We want to believe in this stuff, even if we don't. Uh, this is the reason that uh, <laughs> our good friend Doc Hogs and, and others, they bristle at a lot of these subjects and want to show them for what they are and in their realm, justifiably so, but they don't believe them wholeheartedly or or scoff at a lot of these things, which is fair. Yeah. But why do we do this? Because it is magical getting back to what James Randi does on stage. Right. There is a magical aspect to all this and a bit of mystery and wonder, and that is fun and exciting. Yeah. Blake from Monster Talk says, you know, his side of it is not exciting. It's not sexy. Right, right, right. To say no to everything is not fun. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a wet blanket yeah. on all of this. Yeah. Uh, but no, you know, in my opinion, no less necessary and uh, justifiable. So you see the spoon and you go, Ugh, and that's when the eye roll starts. Yes. But if she, I guarantee you, if she were doing that in front of you, either you would be a little freaked out or you'd be fascinated and wanting to know how she did it in front of your eyes. I have seen mind-blowing close-up magic by an amazing yeah. magician, Helder Gamares. Here, here's the thing. There's no pretense in that. You know what I'm saying? When you see that, and that's what I'm telling you, is that I think this adds to it, is that there's no pretense that it is true, real magic. Right, right. You went to a magic show where you know the guy is just very good at sleight at hand or he had, there's a trick to it. Yeah. And sometimes... You know, you and I are pretty good at this. We know how some things work and I don't enjoy it any less. Like uh, you'll have somebody uh, have something magically appear under a hanky. Yeah. You know, that little test they do, they clink it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's yeah. like, uh, I saw, I saw what he uh, put in there to clink that again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's what I love as well. Not to give anything away. Like it's like the, uh, the other magic tricks where you, you throw the cover over something and then you you peel the cover back; it's disappeared. Well, with the lighting, I've I sat at a magic show once at a big stage show in Vegas, and I could see that the blanket had two layers to it. Yeah. So you, you throw it over the car. Yeah. And then you peel back the top layer, but there's still black velvet covering up the car that looks like it's disappeared. Right. We all know the car didn't go anywhere magically; it didn't a port. Right. And I didn't like it any less right. knowing how it how the trick worked. What I'm saying in this case here is because you see these tropes 
that starts the eye roll, that starts the groan. And yes, it's unfortunate. I don't know what you'd, how would it be more believable other than if you saw that in person and you maybe held her hands while she's doing it and you brought the spoon. Well, that's what I wanted. I want to hear where the spoons came from. I'm just going to, you know, I want <laughs> okay. to know where the spoons came from All and right. I want to know. And then if the spoon thing is real, why is it a spoon? Why is not it work with a fork or, or whatever or a knife or what? But they did say that it happened with other objects. Yes. I mean, I can see an environment where a lot of people get convinced and excited about something where they forget a little bit about the standards that need to be maintained to observe it scientifically. And they don't stop to think, oh, she's been alone with these spoons for a week. They're all pre-softened. What was the chain of custody on the spoons? It sounds silly, but like, I, I do want to know that. I want to know that. So that's just me. There's other things about this case that still blow me away. I'm just like, that's, that's a thing that I'm, I'm curious about. You know, in the book, they're saying she basically bent hundreds of spoons in all kinds of different environments. And there was a metallurgist involved in researching mm -hmm. the material to check it for structural changes at the, uh, I guess, the atomic level and also uh, crystalline changes in glass as well. So not really sure there, but the Polish Biosynodic Society published a hypothesis in uh, 1983. It went into a newspaper and so many calls came in a switchboard at the paper that the switchboard like shorted out. This was like brought a lot of fame to this. And this was all before the first real investigation, the more scientific one started with her. There were some things that happened at the school, and I mentioned earlier the flower pot that fell off the shelf when she was hesitant to go in somewhere. There was some other evidence. Now, again, Forrest, and you got to tell me what you think here, but this is kind of anecdotal evidence from the teachers. But the school that she went to, she was treated very well there. The students were taught to accept her and to accept that there were some strange things going on with her, and it seemed like the teachers were really going out of their way to take care of her. In fact, she had, had been sick a fair amount just for normal uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. And during the time that a lot of things were going on, the teachers were going out of their way to come up with lesson plans that allowed her to continue to stay on course, and they were helping her. And there's some implication between the lines that maybe she had some kind of difficulties. I, I, I don't really know, but it may be socially awkward or whatever else, as, as you made reference to earlier in the book. For whatever reason, the book makes a point of mentioning that she had a, a particularly rough time with puberty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wasn't sure what the, I, I'm a man, I'm not going to pretend to know what puberty is like for a young lady. I, I mm -hmm. asked my wife about it. She was like, I don't know what that means either. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what it meant. So I'm sure we'll get, I'm sure I'm opening the door for a lot of emails there, but. Oh, um, no, listen, it's also based on the individual. Uh, we know a lot of uh, young males that are struggling emotionally, yes. physically, pimples, weird growth spurts. Yeah, that part hair. I know. I, I, yeah, I did all of that. So <laughs> right. that happened so to you, me. I had giant you, feet and I was like four <laughs> feet tall. So there's, there's, I, I, uh, I, I went through that stuff. I just, I can't say what it is for a girl, but for whatever reason, they felt compelled enough to put that in the book. They mentioned that that may be a component, but I, I don't know if that is a fair assessment of being a component of whatever was going on with her. But I do know that the teachers cared very much for her, and she cared so much for this school that after the family got doxxed, they move almost 40 minutes away mm -hmm. to a new place where they were managed to stay protected in terms of their new address. She continued to come back and go to that school, even though it was a 40-minute trip to the school, because she felt so comfortable there with her classmates and these teachers. Now, there was a couple of teachers, and they wind up being interviewed in uh, The Elusive Force, which is really fascinating. There's a lot of interviews with the witnesses, which is one of the great things about that testimony, The Elusive Force. And I'm so glad that the American translation came out on this because it's, it's really fascinating. But anyway, one of the teachers had mentioned that she thought that Yoasha did have pronounced ESP, coming back to the Zener cards or being able to read people's minds. And one of the reasons that she thought that was because, and again, this is super anecdotal, but she had called her up to the blackboard during math class to put the formula on the board, classic sort of, you know, how, how do you solve this problem? And Yoasha was having problems with math and had went up there and she just, she didn't know what to write. And then something just popped into her head and mm -hmm. she wrote out this big elaborate thing that had absolutely nothing to do with the question. Right. And the teacher was like, uh, nope, that is wrong. You get an F for participation today, whatever. Mm -hmm, we'll work mm -hmm. on it. See me after class, sit back down. And then the teacher looked down at her notes and went to dictate the next problem for another student and realized that Yoasha had written on the board the solution to the problem that the teacher had not read out loud yet. 
Mm-hmm. Again, it's anecdotal, but it's a very compelling story. It's a very <laughs> well, compelling story. That's uh, the thing. Sometimes you can be off with that. It's funny you mentioned that. Just last night, there's Grimm, which yes. Rich Haddam worked on. Yes, that's he did. one of my dad's favorite shows. And then after that, 9 p.m. to uh, midnight or 1, they're just playing a lot. Every night it's uh, X-Files. So last night was the one where uh, Fox Mulder is uh, in a psychotic fugue state of sorts, and he can't even communicate, and he attacks violently. And uh, it's like he's all brains. So then uh, assistant director Skinner doesn't know what to do. And he, he gets, uh, Fox needs help, gives a little, uh, gives him a little message as he attacks him. And uh, so he gets a guy who used to work for the government in remote viewing. There I said oh, it. Right. Uh, said but he it. was talking about that, but not to the degree that we did. And he just kind of mentions it. So it's not kind of a knowing nod of anything really other than uh, it was just kind of a known thing, the word to pop onto people. And the idea though, is that he sets up these little monitors like the Zener cards, except they're pictures, right? So there's a monkey, there's a, a, a picture of a, a tree or something in nature, the Roman Colosseum, whatever, and then a UFO. And he's supposed to pick the UFO. And so they run the test and he's like, he's getting them all wrong. And the guy that uh, Fox asked for says like, well, he's getting about, I don't know, was it 4%, 20%, you know, 20% is the best guess. Uh, some of your better people can do 30 or 40%, which is a little better, better than guessing, which is what we talked about in the last uh, episode. And the idea is that, uh, well, he seems like he can't function at all. He's totally messed up. He's catatonic almost. And then Skinner says, well, do the test again, but turn it all the way up, which means make the images appear faster. And once he starts doing that, he's getting them all right because he's anticipating which pictures are going to show up on the little tiny monitors before they happen. Right. So it's not like he's actually wrong. And it's a way to think about these kind of things. It's not that he's wrong. It's that he's ahead of the game. Right. And as this guy said, uh, it's like he's all brain. Yeah. His real stat is cranked up so high, he seems not like he's functioning at all. Right. And again, it's like that, that, that twilight zone where they go to that town and realize, or they think that everybody's frozen in time. No, they're just moving so fast, the other people can't see them. Right. They're totally out of sync, totally at an uncommunicable frequency that's imperceptible to others, and they appear to be not moving at all. If you were in their point of view, you could see them and then the other people would seem like they're frozen in time. Yeah. And so it's a way of looking at it. And in this case, that's something that happens with psychic abilities. I, I believe it's like something's kind of right, but something's kind of off. It's a little bit like the Mothman prophecies. It's not the chemical plant that's in danger. It's the bridge. Right. Same correct night or area, wrong item. Yeah. In here with, with her case is that, uh, yeah, there's something going on and maybe just so, uh, as again, Charles Fort would say a wild talent, but is uncontrollable that it's happening and it's, it's unfocused. Her meters cranked way up. So things are now, instead of like a, a little matchbook or a compass dial twirling around, it's entire pieces of crockery right. flying and mirrors and faucets bending. There is a, there's a pinched faucet or photo of it that yeah. supposedly be was bent in the infirmary, in the sanitarium that she was held in. And so there's a lot of crazy stories like that, that are, again, if you don't believe any of this at all, then none of this makes uh, uh, any difference. Uh, if you believe that something's going on, there's a lot of fascinating anecdotes, which prove that something is being seen by a lot of different people who are, I would guess, impartial, ambivalent to objective on this. And so there's a phenomenon going on here, but what is causing that? That's what we don't know. What is the mechanism by which this works? And what you were saying about being ahead of the game, and that's a really good uh, metaphorical case from the X-Files because the, there was another teacher, and this is a separate teacher that said, and this is even more of a stretch, where it's like, oh, well, is she imagining this? Or, I, you know, I don't know. But there was another teacher who said that sometimes when she could see that Yoasha was struggling with something, the teacher would concentrate and not trying to necessarily send her a message, but just be right. like, come on, you know this. And in her yeah. mind, she's thinking the answer, like all good teachers do and instructors in any scenario, yeah. whether it's your martial arts teacher, your piano teacher, whatever. They're like, you're always like, if you're a teacher and you're real into teaching, you're you're exploding with wanting to give your student <laughs> the answer. And what this teacher was saying yeah. was that Yawasha seemed to go from being completely blank right. to then giving out an answer. And it would be structured grammatically yeah. and stylistically and thematically in exactly the way the teacher had had it in her mind. Yeah. 
Well, so there you go. Yawasha went from not knowing the answer to not only giving the right answer, but giving it in the format that exactly matched what the teacher was thinking about when she wanted her to get it so bad. It's a bit of reverse will, manifestation, and uh, intention, all buzzwords that are very popular these days, very fashionable, right. especially manifestation, manifesting. And it is a little bit, that's how Uri Geller said stuff happens. He was just like, yes. well, how do you, what do you think about it? He's like, I want to do bend. I bend. I say bend, bend. And then yes. he, he forces it. He, again, that's intention, will, concentrated, focused effort, laser beam, or he's showing up with bent spoons and keys. Yes. Have at that what you will. But the idea with her is that there's a bit of a blank slate, which a lot of people say works for them getting a, a psychic impression. They clear their mind, go into the three screens method, whatever it is. You got your uh, your, your toolkit and you, you, you blank. It's a little bit like scrying. You blank that canvas, you blank the screen, and then something is, uh, is put onto it. And in this case, it may be just that she's, again, turns down the, the dial, the rheostat, the potentiometer, and is able to receive something psychically. It's going the other way. Instead of her making, uh, reading the teacher's, uh, or, or said putting a thought into the teacher's mind, she's receiving it. And also uh, she's not projecting outward, uh, outwardly that kind of energy where things are now flying around. Well, all, all these things are happening. These people are trying to figure out what's going on. And eventually a particular doctor gets involved, Dr. Ostahush Gadua. And uh, yes, I did look that up and practice it several times <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> Uh, but he, he, he made a real investigation happen. He actually was a medical doctor who ran the paraplegic ward at the Miners Medical and Vocational Rehabilitation Center Number 1 in Tornowski Gori. And he put a team together in May of 1983. Another interesting thing about Dr. Gadua, he, and I may call him Dr. G from here on out, just to yeah, I think people. that's fine. Yeah. Uh, he was also an acupuncture pioneer in Poland. I know some folks don't believe in acupuncture, but uh, mm -hmm. as... As somebody who has had it work miracles mm. for me, I am a full really? believer in it. Yes. Really? Um, Interesting. Yes. I went in in the cases where it's helped me not knowing whether I believed in it or not and came out usually much better in much better shape. Huh. <laughs> so okay. there's two tracks of it these days, at least around where I live now in Greensboro, North Carolina. There's a new, more modern version of it that requires a different uh, type of education. Forgive me, I don't know the difference. Really? I can't remember the names. And then, then there's other people that practice the more ancient method methodology, which is the one that worked better for me. In fact, I had one 20 minute visit, uh, completely alleviated severe lower back pain I had been having for two weeks. I walked wow. out fine and it never came back. But of course, the lady I saw who I was like, oh my God, you're amazing. She was like, I'm retired. I only see like one person a week. And I was like, great. <laughs> but, uh -huh. uh, but so far I've been okay with that. I think I mentioned that on the show before. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about Dr. G. I wanted to read some sections here from The Elusive Force about his experiences with his investigations into Yuasha, because we're going to get more into this in part two. Dr. Godua is one of the pioneers of acupuncture in Poland, and he has begun to collaborate with bioenergy therapists, although not without reservations, which he has expressed in many public discussions and speeches. As he has stated... And he has not changed his opinion to date. This approach was dictated to him by one of the cardinal deontological tenets of the medical profession, primum non nocer, first do no harm. Dr. Gadua simply recognized that if bioenergy therapy can prove helpful in treating certain illnesses, particularly those of psychosomatic origin, there's no reason to reject such assistance. And I think this is really cool. I think this says a lot, uh, this is me talking here, about him. It's like, so what if this is quackery? If it makes people feel better, let's give it a shot. Do no harm. First, well, do no I, harm. I say that about everything. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, exactly. You do. But you that is something you have brought up well, on the that, show a lot. And <laughs> that I, I came. That that was cemented bad, way back with the sludge entity episodes where people yeah. were uh, giving us in the family. Why not uh, try this? Slack. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Uh, my point is that uh, if you're a parent with a sick child, I don't think that you really care where this is coming from or why or how it's that it's working. It's hard yes. to argue with success. Yes. Well, uh, getting back to this uh, excerpt, participating regularly in symposia organized by the psychotronic societies, clubs, and organizations, and following the foreign literature in this field, Dr. Gadua decided to verify personally whether and to what extent it would be possible to study the phenomenon of 13-year-old Yowasha Gajewski by means of current scientific methods and the latest technology. This endeavor was facilitated by the fact that he quickly won the confidence of the child. 
His very first visits to the Gajewski's home convinced Dr. Gadula that the phenomena occurring there were real. Over a relatively brief period, he observed, among other things, amazing acoustical effects in Yawasha's presence. Concentrated at first around the girl, they would gradually expand to fill the entire apartment. They were similar to high-voltage discharges. Some resembled the scratching or claws of clicking. The doctor captured these sounds on tape. When he played them back shortly afterward for a friend of his, a PhD in physics, the friend said, quote, listen, I believe you, but you realize it doesn't prove anything. Such sounds are easy to produce, end quote. Mm -hmm. Right, replied Dr. Gadua. Then let's try to study the child under laboratory conditions, which will rule out the possibility of a hoax regardless of the results. So he went out and tried to round up people. It took a while for the same thing that we always talk about. Scientists are like, oh, I don't want to get labeled studying mm-hmm. this weird stuff. I'm like, I won't get any more grants and everyone will think I'm foolish. There were people that he brought in that Yoasha didn't like, that if they didn't have the right kind of bedside manner, it's, it's right. made clear that she was put off by people. And she also was put off by the sort of performing monkey nature of things sometimes, which is to your point about what Carson and the Amazing Randy did to Uri Geller, the whole like, here, do the thing now, do the thing. There's a certain amount of pressure there <laughs> Well, that, yeah, that, that can, makes that it can. not work. Right. And then it's just like, oh, well, you never did it. It was always a hoax. I, I do get that side of your point about Geller. But Dr. G did find out that there was a way he couldn't get any grants to study this. But then he found a way of doing it. And the way that he did it was to arrange. And and I will again ask Dr. Horan if this is if I'm if I'm conveying this the right way. But it's my understanding that the way that he acquired funding to analyze what was going on with her was by bringing in metallographic and crystallographic uh, studies of the materials that were being shattered or uh, teleporting around the room and getting destroyed. It was to study the metallurgy and the glass that was being affected by her. And by incorporating that into the scientific research, then these wherever this money came from, whether and I don't understand the structure of the scientific community in Poland in the 80s, but where whatever, however, the money funneled down into something he could use, he was able to do it by putting that package into right. what they were doing in the studying. So he got together, uh, he did the medical supervision. There was a biophysics, psychological analysis, uh, and then the metallurgical analysis as well. They worked for several months, again, quoting the book here, the outcome of the project was a report compiled by Dr. G on October 27, mm. 1983, and it was submitted to the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. Briefly, its most significant findings were that, first of all, it should be emphasized with the numerous experiments conducted with Yawasha Gajewski. They have proved beyond all doubt that the phenomenon connected with her is real. This was borne out not only by the metal samples she had bent without using physical force at the Institute of Metallography and Welding Technology, and thus under fully controlled conditions, some of these experiments were taped, but above all by the repeated direct observations of researchers who witnessed the paranormal movement of various objects. This definitely banished any doubt concerning the reality of the phenomenon itself, what its mechanisms and causes may be, however, remains an open question. So uh, that's some of the stuff I really want to get into with uh, Dr. Horan and also with uh, Brandon about their reactions to this reports uh, and the information that was taped. Like anything else, again, there were things that were taped, activities that were captured. We don't have access to this. And this is one of those things that we come across sometimes with um, things that happened in foreign countries. And there's also a language barrier. It's hard to run down the proof that we're used to finding on the cases that we Mm -hmm. do the digging on. And we have people who dig for us too, and they can find just about anything. But when you're going from English to Polish to something that was only in the news in Poland for about two months, it's real hard to scrape together this stuff. And the media associated with this research, you know, we don't know where that is. Uh, So maybe we'll find that out in uh, part two. Mm. So whenever you come across a case like this, and we've seen a lot of cases of all different kinds in the, in the 10 years that we've been doing this, you're always looking for that. What is that moment what, that makes this one different from the ones we've talked about before? Mm-hmm. What is the thing that really stands out? And, you know, when you, when we run into listeners, whether we're at MonsterFest or whatever, and somebody says, yeah, what is an episode that really stuck with you? And they're out there. There's definitely some of those that really stuck with us. But this story does not disappoint. I'm not sure I'm ever going to forget the story you're about to hear. So we're going to wrap up part one here with one of the most compelling instances of aportation that we've ever heard in a poltergeist case. 
two people witnessed an incident in Yuasha's room at a sanatorium at Zakopada on January 28, 1985. They had been employed there for many years and had never shown an interest in psychic phenomena. What transpired was this. Around 10 a.m., Christina Kolak went to room 309 wanting to check on Yoasha to see if she planned to go skiing. When she reached the door, she noticed Maria Voitas Opiela cleaning the lavatory across the corridor. She asked the ward attendant to wash the mirror there, which was a little dusty. The two women stood in the corridor near the closed double doors to room 309, behind them across the hall. The lavatory door, however, remained open. All of a sudden, they heard a crash in Yuasha's room. Then the sound of breaking glass. The head nurse rushed inside to see what had happened. She noticed fragments of glass whirling in the air, which formed in a line as if pulled by an invisible magnet and flew in her direction. Her apron was showered from top to bottom with glass. Meanwhile, Yuasha was sitting in a chair and, according to the head nurse, cried out, Better not come in now. The warning came too late. The woman had already been attacked. But that is not the most important aspect of this whole episode. Upon entering the room, Nurse Kolak saw that the floor was strewn with fragments of glass, so she automatically looked towards the sink and the shelf over which the mirror hung. The mirror was in its proper place. Almost at that very moment, attendant Voitas Opiela, who was in the lavatory, noticed that the mirror she was supposed to wash, which had been there just a few seconds before, had disappeared without a trace. Not a single piece of glass was on the floor. The object had simply vanished into thin air, ending up a split second later, shattered to bits, on the floor of room 309 across the hall, whose door had been closed at the time. That's going to wrap up episode 281 of Astonishing Legends. We'll be back in two weeks with part two of this series. If you're missing us next week, find and subscribe to the other shows from the Astonishing Legends Network instead. The Midnight Library, Scared All the Time, and Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. We have links to all of them in our show notes. You can also find us doing the Astonishing Junk Drawer at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel who is also head of research in the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Hi, I'm R.A. Fadley. Astonishing Legends. This is Randy from Vancouver Island, Canada. The cow goes moo. I'm Chantelle from Victoria, BC. The rooster goes cockagoo doo No implied promise. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Caressia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at DeadStreetProductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>